Thank you. Good morning. Um, first, let me thank the, um, the organizers of the meeting for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the cruise line teledermatology service we have. It's different from what Carrie's been talking about because this, these are basically moving cities around the world where there is medical staff, nursing staff, a formulary, and um, good connectivity. So let me um, start. So the University of Miami Teledermatology Service provides rapid access to University of Miami dermatologists for crew, for Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines and Carnival Cruise Lines around the world on ships, and for guests that have urgent dermatologic issues. We started the contract with Royal Caribbean June of 2010, and with Carnival, they were excited to hear about our success in Royal, and so that started November 2012. Both of those cruise lines have their headquarters located in Miami. And our service is promised for a turnaround of 72 hours for a routine case, and if something is an urgent uh, stat case, it's a promise of 24 hours, and most of the time, um, both those uh, turnaround times are much, um, if are exceeded, they're much faster. I see about 70 cases a month. I see most of the cases, and then if I'm on vacation or away, although I'm still seeing consults now, there are two other dermatologists on faculty who um, evaluate the cases, and often there's a resident who rotates with me and sees some of those cases. So Royal Caribbean has 45 ships um, around the world. They've increased over the years, and we have now about 48,000 crew. There are five cruise lines, and that includes Celebrity and Pulmador, and um, that are part of the Royal Caribbean um, cruise lines, and then Carnival Cruise Lines, although it says plural, it's really just one line. And that's 24 ships, and it's 28,000 um, crew. So the demographics on the ships, it's um, a relatively healthy, young, and middle-aged population, 24 to 63, with a median age about 29. And there are more men on these ships who work there, about three to one. Um, and then when we see guests, and that really takes about one or two percent of the consults that come through, they can be any age. So six months is the youngest and up to 79. And when we see the elderly population, there uh, are more comorbidities that they have and they're more challenging. And guests are seen always as a stat because they're only on the ship for maybe a week or so. So the dermatology ser teledermatology service provides this skin care to a, a geographically dispersed population that is an employee population and they are promised to get care. Um, what this allows the docs on board to do is to manage their care while they, the crew members are on board. It's difficult to go to an offshore dermatologist to see someone on a Saturday or Sunday when these people are off isn't really possible. Um, and there's um, a cost to that. I'm also involved with some medical evacuations. Do people need isolation or do they need to be uh, transported off ship to hospital? And there is a cost savings, and that's why this has been a continuing annual renewal um, and an avoidance for these, um, for these companies. But there are special challenges and issues, and it's, it's an interesting way to think about it. It's a limited drug formulary. I do go over it um, every year and make suggestions. They aren't always accepted because there's a cost and that if somebody were to need something, you could, I could suggest that it be ordered as a non-formulary and it could come on the ship in a week or two. Um, and then there are, it really is a moving city more so, um, and so there are, the population has jobs that are really varied. So there's scuba divers, dancers, engineers, stagehands, youth um, directors, and chefs, um, florists, <laughs> spa therapists. So it's really a collection of patients that is not in my regular practice at the university. And, and the thing is, there's no redundant crew. So to give someone off work or dry work, if you can't fulfill your job, 
you will be, um, your, your contract will be terminated. So there's an, uh, there's an urgency to get these people back to work. Um, and so the question is, are they fit for duty? And I will often tell, take people off and then recommend, these are only recommendations, and then they can um, come, come back for evaluation. And if the erosions are healed or the crusting is healed, maybe they'll come back. And then there's a, um, a, a term called medical, med, maximum medical improvement, which is, you know, you've, we've done this and this and this and this. Does this person, should we terminate this contract? It, I think I've only been involved in one of those um, those cases. And then the question is medical isolations. On these ships, there are um, two medical doctors. One is an intensivist, and the other is a regular doctor for both these cruise lines. And then there are at least two nurses, and there are isolation rooms. But they need to be used judiciously, and, um, and then evacuation, as I mentioned. So what we did for each of the cruise lines is that we did a rollout for the entire fleet. So first, we shared the, the software with the cruise line's IT team. They evaluated it, happily they approved it, and then my team and the university, the, teledermatol the telehealth department gave usernames and passwords. We gave it to each of the ships, uh, two doctors and nurses. Uh, reports would go back to all those people in case somebody was off or on vacation. I learned what capabilities they had on ships so they can take plane films um, and basic labs, CBC, chem <coughs> panel. Um, I'm not sure they can do lipids, and I learned that they really don't do, I don't ask for bacterial cultures because it would take two weeks to get results, and that um, wouldn't be that useful. As I mentioned, I reviewed the formulary. I wanted to put tacrolimus on it, which we use very often topically, and that was way too expensive, and the same with caspitriol. So I have occasionally recommended that. Um, I did recently get um, oral ivermectin on for scabies, and, and that was something they really did like getting on board. We have a, an online training site, um, and so what we had on there were many things, and there, since there are new crew crew new healthcare um, staff that come on, they review the lectures that are there on common dermatoses, common dermatologic terminology, so they know what a papule plaque and a nodule, so they can s select those terms on a drop-down menu. They also can see about photography. So I know there was discussion about, well, we don't get good images. So we have... Um, a PowerPoint that is online so that they can tell, they can see what is good for a teledermatology imaging. And so we tell them take a regional, include a land, an anatomical a landmark, like an elbow or a, a, a jawline, include a, a close-up, and then always give a tangential so you can get a sense of the surface. And um, we also say give complementary sets. So if you're going to tell me about a rash on the dorsum of the hand, show me the palms, show me the feet, same dorsal and plantar, or at least tell me there's no involvement there. Um, and they've learned over time. I lectured to each of the annual educational conferences before we rolled out the program, and then every year since. Um, and um, they really are learning and sending better cases in. And then what we required was a test case from every ship before they were able to send consults, and we did sort of a checkoff. And what we always asked for was, show me the dorsum of the right hand on an appropriate surface, meaning solid color, non-reflective. And these are all guide included in the guidelines from the American Telemedicine Association for teledermatology that I have been very involved with. Um, so that was required, and then we, we started. <coughs> In the software we use, um, there's a free text space. And in that, I've taught them to really tell me the story and its comments. Tell me where the rash or the lesion started, where it spread to, what symptoms, um, and tell me what you've attempted on board. I often will write back to them, include the dose and the timing, <laughs> because sometimes they just say prednisone, which isn't that helpful. And then include if they've had this rash before. 
or a family member had melanoma, if that's what you're worried about, and tell me your working diagnosis or a specific question. And I'm going to go through some cases with you so you get a sense of things that we get in. And I always start my cases with my response with, based on the images and history we received, my impression is as follows. Because as you know, um, garbage in, garbage out. And so what I see is what I'm going to tell them about. And this is where I would also say, unable to diagnose, photographs fuzzy. Number one was the best one. And I give feedback. So over time, with the various ships, I do get better, um, better images and history. And um, this, this little phrase was what my <coughs> legal department came up with years ago when I started doing telemedicine in 1997. And this is what is in the ATA guidelines as well. So common diagnoses we see are, we see a lot of dermatitis. So atopic, contact numular, um, allergic or irritant dermatitis, alopecia areata, which actually they've gotten to understand and, and um, diagnose various folliculitis, tinea, um, warts and then um, psoriasis and in fact um, I have been able to train by writing full descriptions of how to give intralesional catalog because I used to be sending them off ship and that was really a difficult thing to do and so they've been able to do that well. Um, these are some of the images, all these images are from the ship. They also are getting good at pityriasis rosea and I think you can appreciate the nice colorative scale. And so this is what came in. This is trimmed down, but a four-week rash, still getting more lesions, and we're <coughs> treating with cutrimisol. And often they think tinea, you know, we would always, I always say think dermatitis. Don't think tinea is your first line, but they're saying it's not more. And so what will often happen is that I will say this looks like such and such. Ask, ask the um, crew member, did this person have a rash, that a, a single lesion that was larger that started seven to 10 days earlier and then other lesions that were smaller expanded? And so that the beauty of being able to do dermatology to this population is these people, it's a captive population, they're there. The doctor can go back and ask the question to these crew members. They can get new photographs and um, so it's, it's um, actually um, a very satisfying way to practice. And so that was the diagnosis that was sent back. See a lot of hands. So on the left, um, this was, I think you can see nice burrows or nice web space and here as well. And I can tell you, I know this is scabies because I went, when I wrote back to this doc, I said, looks like scabies. Thank you for including the web space. Look at the genitals. If there are papules there, any genital papules, itchy or not, are pathognomonic for scabies. And so he did send me a lesion, and so this is a confirmatory. And to go through what really it means to treat a patient, either with permethrin or oral ivermectin, if it's on board, and now it's on board most of the ships, it's really not just you treat the patient once and that's it. It's a bit complicated. The gal in the middle was someone who was a violinist and had used a new rosin for her bow and had a really rip-roaring um, contact dermatitis. This was someone who had an asymptomatic papillosquamous um, eruption on the body and the palms, and they were very pretty copper pennies of uh, syphilis. I hadn't seen that in a long time. And this is someone that um, has really terrific dyshydrotic eczema who I just saw recently, I just, last week I got a follow-up consult and on my software I get pop-ups of prior cases and photographs. <clears throat> and so I saw what he looked like before and now he has another flare. So um, they do send good pictures. Also interesting infections. So this was um, a guest who came in and what they did is that they sent me the photograph of when he onboarded the ship when he did not have the redness. So this was three days ago, burning, painful for erysipelas. This was probably leishmaniasis with the history that was provided. And this is a nice um, candida intertrigo that was submitted. This 
I'll tell you, I agree it's not a good photograph, but you know that this is not a good condition, and so it's full of cellulitis, and so even if you don't get a good photograph, you can give advice, and the advice was, get this person to a hospital, this is a guest who is about 80, 79, I guess, the oldest one, and happily they were right near Jamaica, and so this person did get to the hospital. So common recommendations that I give is, I'll give a diagnosis or a differential and I'll say go back and take a look at these areas like I did to the fellow who did have scabies. Look at the genitals, look here or there. I'll give antibiotics or antifungals, steroids, oral or um, topicals, and antihistamines. And, and, you know, people who are not dermatologists are often hesitant to give fluorinated steroids topically and so there's a lot of hydrocortisone that's provided and I need to, I have been educating them over the years to give different, the different levels of steroids. I use bleach compress, ble bleach baths a lot for my atopics, it's, it's pretty standard, but when I gave that as part of my lecture um, to the yearly conference, they said, we don't have baths on the ships, <laughs> and it didn't occur to me, but those crew, maybe in your, your guest room you did if you were ever on a cruise ship, but those, those staff did not, and so it's one teaspoon to a quart of water, and so those compresses are equivalent, and you can make do. I do a lot of vinegar soaps for paronychia and silver nitrate for the fissures that I see in a lot of the, the um, cooks and the, the um, galley workers. And then basics like cotton gloves, and when again, that very first lecture, I mentioned cotton gloves at night to put over steroids with um, emollients. At the end when it was the Q&A, one of the docs asked the medical, medical director, could you please order cotton gloves because we don't have any on board? And he said, okay. And so all of a sudden there was a change, just like you were saying, you can make these very simple changes that are significant. And then rarely I'll use non-formulary drugs um, uh, because I know that recommending it may mean that it won't happen, but getting the ivermectin on board was, I felt was a big coup. Um, and, and recently there was a recurrent um, atopic and I did get protopic for her. The other thing that I do a lot of is the intranasal mupirocin for these recurring cases of, of um, atopic dermatitis to try to prevent that, and also to do good education about what is an impetigenized dermatitis that needs treatment and shouldn't be working in the kitchen. So some of the consults we get are just for confirmation. Um, in the software I use, we have um, a diagram, and so they put actually their photograph where it is. And so based on that, I knew that we were just on the left side of the body. And here are the images. And um, he's just saying, you know, this is what we started. And do you agree? And it was a good diagnosis. It was a correct dose. And then someone was sent in. Yes, it was zoster. And it was on the face. But the, what I recommended was do get this guy to an ophthalmologist. It looks like there may be some ocular involvement. And so he was sent off ship. And this was a guest. This was the captain's daughter. I was an 18-month-old little girl with a rash <clears throat> for three days. It wasn't particularly itchy, but it was um, thought to be insect bites, but it's persisting. It hasn't gotten vaccines yet. And the question is, is this varicella? And um, I said, yes, I think this is chickenpox. And, you know, the beautiful dewdrop on a rose petal is how we train our, um, our dermatology residents. And so it was a nice picture there. Then there's some rare diseases. Um, by history, this was relapsing polychondritis, and this was most likely multiple ac acral reticular histiocytosis. My husband is a dermatologist, Dr. Brian Berman. He loves this disease. It's one of like, you know how sometimes you have a favorite disease? So I was thrilled that that was it. And then this is um, the only hydrionitis suppurativa that I had seen, and this person was, was challenging to treat. And then I, they always include the occupation of the individual. I don't know exactly what a wiper is, but they included that, and he was in the engine department. <coughs> Itchy rash, follicular, monomorphic. So I'm thinking, this is a little odd. And so what I asked was, um, any exposure to fiberglass before the rash and the follow-up um, 
consult was, yes, he worked with fibroblasts a few days before the rash, and your diagnosis is spot on. <laughs> and so it was a fibroblast folliculitis, which I hadn't seen in a really long time. There are patients from all over the world that work on these ships. Um, and this was someone, a 59-year-old fellow from Nicaragua. He had a 10-year history of these erosions and pain and inflammation of his right ear. I don't know how actually the doc who did the pre-employment physical didn't notice that, frankly. But um, I thought this um, was probably cutaneous leishmaniasis and referred him to a dermatologist for a prep. And I had just been to a lecture at the a ADA and suggested if it is positive, they contact the CDC for the new drug that's oral, that's available, and that's the only way to get it. So there's um, an education that goes on. We do get some stat cases that are worrisome. And so this was someone who was submitted um, with, he was ill, he had fever, coryza, he had a rash, and um, there was a great worry about measles. This was two years ago. Um, because remember, the, the individual, in the US, most people get vaccinated, but around the world, that's not the case. So there are people who are not, there's not that herd immunity. And so I was concerned about measles. Um, a chest x-ray was ordered, and I suggested he go to hospital just so that there wouldn't be a problem. Well, they, they couldn't do that. They were four days from port. So they supported him, and I learned, I guess, months, months later, that in fact viral titers were done. He did not have measles, but um, you always have to worry on the cautious side. Um, and often I am sent eruptions that are clearly viral eruptions, and the question is, was there a viral illness two or three weeks prior? And they want to know, is this measles? And it's very hard sometimes to, uh, to say for sure. And this is the last case I'm going to show you. This was a, f a young fellow who presented, um, he had had um, some HSV blisters. He presented with really beautiful target, target lesions on his palms, um, erythema multiforme. The history that was submitted was that he had been hospitalized a year ago for Stevens-Johnson syndrome, secondary to HSV. He was on suppressive therapy with acyclovir. He was supposed to continue for a year. He stopped a month ago. And here we are again, and so he, um, he did okay, but it was, it was clear what that diagnosis was. Less than 5% of, of our cases are, some, are referred out, and often they're for growths where a biopsy cannot be taken on the ship. They don't have that cap capability. So a month's growth, again, you might say, well, this isn't a great photograph. You know, it's, this, it's dark, but this was a dot a year ago, and this was someone from Australia. This person needs to be evaluated, and it was a 22-year-old gal. And then here is this dark pigmentation. I, I want to suggest it's probably a Hutchinson sign around that cuticle, and that person was also sent for evaluation. So in closing, the teledermatology service we provide gives information for the, the particular patient who's referred and also for future patients. And we provide a diagnosis, a differential diagnosis, targeted workup and treatment with the drugs that are on board. And we also give recommendations for, um, for follow-up with the ship's captain, with the ship's docs, and with teledermatology or for an in-person. And we always give a time frame, follow-up in a week, and then follow-up with us either as needed or um, we give a time period. And with that, I will say thank you.